Hare Krishna, and a welcome to all our viewers to this GBC Strategic Planning Live Facebook. Uh, we've had a lot of sessions so far, and today we have with us somebody who is very accomplished in the field of academia and also much loved by the devotee community. And I would like to welcome Shona Karishi Prabhu. Uh, welcome, Prabhuji, on behalf of myself and on behalf of the strategic planning team. Uh, a lot of devotees would be aware of his accomplishments, but I'm just going to a little bit, you know, share with you that Shana Krishi Prabhu is the director of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. He's a lecturer, broadcaster, and a Hindu chaplain at the Oxford University. Uh, his interests include education, comparative theology, communications, and leadership. He's also a member of the Commission on Religion and Belief in British Public Life by Wolf University, Cambridge. In 2013, the Indian government appointed him to sit on the International Advisory Council of the Auroville Foundation. Hey, Krishna Prabhu. Looks like we have just lost Mataji. Give me a second. I'll try and pull her back in again. Okay. Are we are we still live? We still live. Yes. So um, maybe I could uh, ask the first question of myself. Um, uh, I, I, because we're live, I suppose I should be saying something rather than uh, not saying something. Um, Parijata, will, she sent me a list of questions that she was going to ask. Oh, here she is. Parijata, do you have a question to ask? I'm so sorry. Internet lag. I'm so sorry for that. I, uh, I but yeah, I thank you. So was, I'm just was saving everyone. Sorry. Go ahead. And uh, yeah, so just we just extended a warm welcome to you. And uh, I think we would just begin with, um, uh, I think, yeah, the main, uh, I mean, we're so grateful that you could, you know, be with us during this session, especially because, you know, you recently, we just got to know that you recently contracted the coronavirus uh, and you're still dealing with some of those post-COVID symptoms. So can you share a little bit about that, that, you know, um, how are you dealing with this? Um, well, um, when you're sick, it's not a, kind of not a question of how you're dealing with it. You're just you're just left with it, <laughs> uh, and it's just life. Then um, it it was uh, it was difficult for one one week in particular where it was very difficult to breathe, and that's um, that's difficult. Breathing is is quite necessary. So so that that was difficult, and it did. I did have to seriously. I live alone. Uh, and I was quarantined, so I did have to think, okay, maybe this is it then. You know, if breathing stops, if the difficulty gets too bad, uh, that's it. So for the first time in my life, I considered making a will and looked that up and, and all that. It was it was difficult. And then the after effects, I've been recovering for about seven weeks and still not quite there yet. So it's it's uh, it, it affects everyone differently, and that's just how it affected me. And it's very much Krishna's mercy. It's just another another manifestation of Krishna helping me understand my mortality, that we all have to prepare for any eventuality, and that life is just, um, as Nartam says, it's just a little drop of water on a leaf, just tottering. So it was um, very sobering, so very... Very kind of Krishna to uh, help me uh, have that realization. So, I mean, you just mentioned that you stay alone. So, I mean, one of the key aspects of um, dealing with, you know, or the treatment in relation to COVID is to, you know, be quarantined. 
um, so did you feel um, you know was it like especially emotionally or mentally challenging that you know you are in quarantine you could not connect so i think you're socially isolated and did that affect your uh, emotional state of mind uh well it didn't uh, a lot of my service is dealing with people so um i must be honest it was a great relief <laughs> not to, <laughs> to be isolated <laughs> uh, <laughs> didn't have any difficulty with that at all and it's interesting in Indian culture, um, isolation is something that people practice for their whole life. Uh, so it's not it's not unusual for us. Um, uh, and so so I, I I appreciated the break, shall we say, from the stress, uh, etc. And the devotee community here in Oxford, we have a small little community, but every single day a different devotee family or devotee would come with food and supplies, and uh, they would take care of me. Um, uh, and it was that was wonderfully nourishing uh, emotionally, um, and I suppose as well emotionally. Us men were not famous for our being in touch with our emotions, <laughs> so it wasn't the, it wasn't the biggest issue uh, in uh, for, you know for me. Uh, it was a great uh, it was a retreat. It was a spiritual retreat where I really did think about my mortality and what what are the important things in life. So it was of great benefit to have that retreat because some of us don't get the opportunity to retreat very much. We're in the front line all the time. There's no break. There's no holidays. You know, we're devotees. You know, <laughs> uh, but but I think we do have to balance our lives a bit better. And and um, it was helpful for me uh, from that point of view. So, yeah, I think that's really amazing to see how you've taken it so positively. And, uh, you know, we just keep hearing all these statistics in relation to COVID and what's happening. Like I'm in Mumbai, which is like the epicenter for, uh, you know, COVID where cases to, you know, up to six to nine thousand per day. It's, it's, it can be just so crazy. So when you first found out that you were affected, what were the first thoughts that just crossed your mind? I mean, you know, it, it seems like it's something that's happening out there. And then you realize like, oh. This is something happened to me. So, you know, what was your first thoughts when you found that out, and how did you feel? Um, my first thoughts were kind of um, Krishna doesn't give us anything that we don't have the capacity to deal with. I just wish he didn't trust me so much. You know, it's, just, it's just another thing, you know. <laughs> Here's another thing that Krishna is giving me to deal with. Thank you. Uh, and the only response is thank you lord it's prasad it's mercy you know um it could be a new car and it could be covid krishna krishna we have to be able to deal with all these things they're not they're not ultimately the significant things of life this covid thing is just another thing you know it's um 50000 people in the uk have passed away and some devotees some friends of mine some very very nice people um and that's you know that's the way that it will go. Uh, I I just I did think one devotee was giving me some kind of conspiracy theory esque thing that it's a conspiracy on behalf of such and such rah rah. And uh, I really don't have time for things like that. Everything is Krishna for a devotee. We have to see it like that. We have no choice. But I, I did reflect that the industrial revolution has been going on for what 250 years, and we've been abusing mother nature and we've been exploiting her any way we can we've been, we've been trying to dominate her in every way we can and manipulate her and then with one of her smallest little soldiers a tiny 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 little virus she just sends them in like as if it's nothing and it brings the whole world to a standstill we can't cope at all we have no control we don't know what's going on <laughs> and it was just a an, an example of of elegant power by nature, so that that was something that I thought uh, that that shows us that nature is in charge here. Bhumi is is a consort of Vishnu. Uh, she knows what's going on. She's keeping the balance, uh, and there's no need for any other theory than than Krishna is God, and uh, that's the ultimate reason behind everything. And we can look for other reasons. Uh, and and they may seem valid in a rational sense in this context or that context, but when push comes to shove, Krishna is the controller. Krishna is in charge. It's all running under Krishna's plan. And particularly for a devotee, 
that's our sadhana is to see Krishna in everything, not not to see other explanations. They may be there, but we we choose to bypass them and look beyond them to see Krishna. So Darwinian evolution can explain a lot of things, and this theory of relativity can explain a lot of things, and this other theory can explain a lot of things. But Krishna explains everything, uh, and and for me personally, in my small little world, this was Krishna's mercy for me, and He was very kind to give me this mercy. It's it's so inspiring. Oh, I'm sure this is so inspiring for our audiences out there to you know uh, draw us from how we have accepted the situation in life. And I, I think from what we know of you that you always have had that depth to you know understand the deeper meanings and the lessons that you know Krishna is trying to teach. And um, just going a little back into your life. Um, you know, if you were to talk of that, you you know lost your wife Keshava to depression a few years back, and this itself is such a difficult situation because, and I think uh, this is an illness which is you know increasingly affecting thousands of people across the globe, uh, leading to you know its denial, confusion, uh, you know to some cases there is stigma. And uh, I, I can totally relate to that because my own father actually, you know, was that there was a time in his life that he was depressed for a certain part of his life. And it was so difficult for himself to come in terms with what he was going through. And even for us as a family unit. So it's, it's really difficult to see the patient going through something like that. And... Uh, the pain that the loved ones have to, you know, go through, and especially like in your case when you actually lost her to depression. So how did you? I mean, there is nothing that really helps you to come in terms with this loss. But uh, how did you, you know, cope? From where did you get your strength? And you know, what what was it that you know just, you know, kept you going? And you know, what did you hold on to during um. that time? Yeah, th there's no doubt that the association of devotees is is where we get all our strength in spiritual life. Um, that's how Krishna works through devotees. Devotees uh, took care of me at that time. Um, uh, and, and Krishna took care of me um, very um, explicitly. <laughs> Um, my, my uh, so the first point you made was about depression. I, I think we have to recognize depression as an illness, like a disease. It's like you break your leg, then you're not expected to perform on the playing field. You're not even expected to walk up the stairs. If you if you're depressed, then we have to recognize that person is uh, dysfunctional uh, for many activities uh, and until their illness is cured. Or sometimes people are congenitally depressed. They actually, it's a physical uh, difficulty in the brain where physically chemicals can't get to each other and the person can't function. Uh, the brain is the machinery of, of, of uh, our mental energy, um, to how it interacts with the body. And if the machinery is broken, it's difficult for us to function. So, so we do have to recognize that this is a physical and this is a psychological difficulty and it's real and it's a it's an it's an illness and and we have to treat people with that the same empathy as we would treat them if if they broke their leg or broke their arm or had had any difficulty like that because the consequences um can be disastrous uh, in my wife's case she she took her life uh she had been a devotee for so many years had helped so many people become devotees that it was a tremendous shock to people who didn't realize she had been ill for 17 years with a, an illness. And consequently, if you're ill for so long, if you're ill for a week, you feel tamasic. Uh, you have difficulty already. 17 years, she lasted a long time. And uh, Krishna took care of her. And then in the last phase, she she developed depression. And it was quite quick in one sense. but. I had never seen anyone suffer so much. To suffer mentally is is intense suffering that you can't escape from. And there's and in her case and in often cases there are no drugs, unless you practically comatose someone. So it's it's a very difficult disease to have, and it's very difficult to be with someone who has it because 
uh, you feel so um, disempowered. There's nothing you can do to help them. Uh, so that's that's very difficult. And in a devotee circumstance, when someone takes their life, uh, that has more stigma than um, depression among devotees. And uh, I'm not so sure that we can be judgmental in a religious sense to say black and white, this is right, this is wrong. If we read our scriptures, there's people threatening suicide all over the place. The Ramayana is full of people saying, oh, I can't handle this, I'm going to take my own life. It's in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, uh, Junior Haridas actually does take his own life. So we, we do have to have a reality check on, on what is our attitude to these things. And going back to the fact that Krishna is actually God and, and she was Krishna's devotee, then was this not also God's arrangement? And that's what became obvious to me. Um, the moment she died, I was with her when she died. Um, the moment she died, into my head, unbidden, just came um, Krishna is kind. I don't know where that came from. It was such a surreal thought in, in the circumstance. It was 12 midnight. It was during a storm. It was raining. It was in a field. Um, there was an ambulance with sirens. There was a police car. You know, it was a, a, a terribly surreal scene. And th this came into my head. Krishna is kind. And I was trying to think, where, where exactly is the kindness? <laughs> you know, it's very difficult to compute that here. But, but I knew that this was the perspective Krishna was giving me. And I had to learn this. I had to see this in this circumstance. And this is what it means to be a devotee. And and by Krishna's grace, I was able to see it in that circumstance. I came to the um, Yamuna to give Keshva's ashes. And I was kind of giving her back to Krishna. And I came back to the Yamuna a few days later to pray to Krishna, just to thank him for allowing me to come and, and give her back. And uh, <laughs> I kind of... I realized when I was praying, you know, in Vrindavan, many people have this uh, experience. When you're in Vrindavan, everything is instant. Krishna's mercy is instant. You know, you, you get the message clearly. And I was praying, thank you for allowing me to, to give Keshava. And I, I realized I wasn't giving Keshava to Krishna. I never had Keshava. She was always Krishna's. She was such a good devotee. She never lost it right up to the last minute. She never lost her attachment to Krishna. She was clutching on to Krishna as she died. And she, the last word she said to me, she turned and said, chant. You know, that's how focused, how focused is that? You know, so this was Krishna's devotee. She wasn't mine. And the kindness was that I had her association for 28 years. That's like, how kind is that? We all know that we have to part at some time. 28 years is a very good innings. And Krishna gave me the association of this wonderful devotee for all that time, that I could take care of her, that she could take care of me, that we could become friends, that we could explore Krishna together, you know, and be companions in that intimate spiritual sense. What a wonderful um, kindness. You know, so it was like, that was like really realizing it's not about going off into the sunset forever and ever and ever. That's, that's not real. The reality is we do have to part in this lifetime. These bodies aren't the significant, the, the most significant part of our relationship. That our relationship is with Krishna and she was always Krishna's. So she was to go back to Krishna, which she did. So that's that that was that was a, a real realization. So that perspective kept me going. And then of course the Sangha of devotees, Kirtan, you know, is always so wonderful. The devotees are so compassionate and empathetic and tolerant and wise and humble to give us perspective and shore up these perspectives. Although it, I do admit that when people were coming offering condolences in those first days, all that was in my head is Krishna's kind. I was trying to figure this out. And people would come up and say, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'd look at them and say, Krishna's kind. <laughs> and they'd look at me kind of. <laughs> so... So that it was, I had to rein that in a little bit. But Krishna is kind. Thank you so much, Prabhu, for sharing that. You know, that was 
so profound for sharing us about your journey with Keshava and an experience which is so personal, uh, giving us a little insight. Um, it's, it's something difficult, but um, I think it just means a lot for us to, you know, get a little bit of uh, insight into how difficult this is and how Krishna is, you know, at, at the center of everything. So, um, yeah, we are just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of soaking it in what you, you know, you have to shed. And uh, so you said that friends, devotees, of course, the Krishna conscious aspect helped you. I understand you are at the Oxford Center during this time. So did your work during that time also help you to a little bit, you know, engage your mind and just, you know, a little bit move on at that point? Um, it did. You know, um, different things help different people. Uh, grief is, is a natural energy. It's just something that you can't stop. You know, um, no matter how philosophical you are or what, how nice your friends are, grief just comes in waves and you just have to let it out. And, you know, you would stop and cry in the middle of the street. And it was just, it's ridiculous. But you have to let it out. You have to let it go. And I, I realized at the time, I just have to let this happen. This is this is nature. This is bigger than me. I, I don't understand this. Um, and... I, I I just stopped going to work. And not only that, but people in work, I would pop into the office to do some small thing and people would look at me and say, go home. <laughs> it was just, it was, it was just like, forget it, forget it. You know, we got this covered. Um, but I, so I took about two more, more than two months off, uh, which was very, very helpful just to reorient and, and all that. And then, as I said, I went to Vrindavan and, um, how I got back to work was um, I was standing in front of uh, Gornetai in the uh, Krishna Balaram Mandir. And of course, they're so beautiful and everyone had moved on during the, and I just stayed in front of them and just thought, I'll just stay here. And then I, I looked at Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and I'd been there for about a week. And um, I, I realized I hadn't prayed to him. I prayed to everyone in Vrindavan, every, every deity, every sadhu, every every puddle <laughs> I prayed for Keshava. And so I, I realized I hadn't prayed to Bhakti Siddhanta Sarja Thakur. And um, so I put my hands together to pray to him. And and a, a thought came into my mind, you know, what happened to Keshava happened to so many people. It wasn't so special. And then immediately came into my mind, but in the life of a devotee, it's profound. And I, I, just, I don't know where this thought came from. And then... Um, I kind of looked down and his garland fell and his shoes, they knocked his shoes off and his shoes fell on, fell on the floor with a big clatter. There was no one around. <laughs> I looked around to see who's that for and it was, I was the only person there. And so this connection was made. Then that evening, um, a telephone call, I got a telephone call from a, a college in Delhi that I had contacted three months before and they were returning the call three months later, <laughs> I happened to be in India and they wanted to make an appointment to see me um, on the 20th, which was two days before the end of my retreat. But I thought, okay, well, maybe this is Krishna's arrangement. So I said, I'll get back to you. And that evening I went and uh, I went to Balaram in the guest house and said, maybe I should arrange my transport for the 20th. And he said, oh, that's unfortunate. I said, why? He said, that's the... Uh, uh, disappearance day of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. <laughs> I thought, wow. <laughs> so that's the day I, I got back into things. And getting back into things is important. It's important to pick ourselves up. It's important to start to do normal things, even though life doesn't seem normal. You know, or the world, the bottom falls out of our world, without doubt. Um, but it's important to pick ourselves up. And work is absolutely necessary it's not simply therapy it's necessary it's we have to work otherwise the mind um, goes a little bit doolally and the mind is already crazy at the best of times what to speak of when you're in grief so yes so you make a good point work work is important yes, so thank you for sharing that that um, you know how i i 
kind of, you know, when you were saying that, I said, though she physically left, she was actually with you in spirit. And I think she was just, you know, she was kind of in harbinger to bring you closer to Krishna. And, and, and the beautiful thing that you shared, the shoes were there. And, um, you know, that, that was just... Uh, so amazing and it, it really helps to give an insight into yes krishna is kind you just have to understand the deeper meaning into it and and of course we're so happy to know that you know your work helped you i think a lot of people have some sense of guilt that uh, you know they they don't know how to deal with you know their issues or loss and sometimes there is a sense of guilt that you know if i go to, back to work if i go back to doing things it's it's not like they're literally looking back to it but they need to move on. They need to occupy their mind. And as you said, sometimes it's also a, a kind of a therapy to, you know, in, in that journey of, you know, just picking up the pieces and moving on. So I think that was a very good point that you made that, yes, work is important and, and it's part of the journey to move on. So okay. can, um, I just, can I just say something, just a little addendum to that? It's not simply work, actually. No. It's also a sense of, of, of seva. It's a sense of service. It's it's thinking about others and not thinking about yourself because as devotees our work is seva it's it's for other people um it's a way of getting out of our own dilemma our own head and it's like you say you might feel guilty it's particularly the case when someone takes their own life because um everyone who came to offer me condolences who was in any way close they were all saying, oh, I wish I had done more. I should have kept more in touch. I should have I should have been in contact with them more. They all felt guilty. Uh, what to speak of when you're the, the partner? <laughs> then you're thinking, you're revising every, every connection you had in your life, every time you were upset with each other, every time you didn't give her a hug, every time you acted in your ego. It all becomes complicit in some way. Uh, that's how it seems in the head. So that can be very, very difficult. Uh, it is very difficult for a lot of people in that in that circumstance. But um, we can't entertain such thoughts. They're not they're not at all helpful, and they're never true, in the in any real sense. It's it is actually a disease. It's it's a, when someone is in that state, they've they've lost uh, the plot for all kinds of reasons, but often because of depression, and often because they're in that disease condition. It's a very, it's their choice that they've made. It's not, it's not your choice, um, and that's that. That is difficult to deal with. So the the work element is not dwelling on me and my problems and my issues. It's actually helping other people. And when you've suffered grief of a loved one who's very close, or or uh, someone who dies in a tr tragic situation. We do have a responsibility to help other people who are in the same condition. And you quickly find out that there are a lot of people who need help. There are a lot of people that we now have become responsible for. So your workload actually increases, but more relevantly. And, and that's where the therapy comes in, being able to talk about your experience to people who have had the same experience and you're helping each other. That's, that's the therapy. So, yeah. 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 I think that was, you know, a good insight where you said that how when you are grieving and the best way to help somebody uh, to help yourself during grief is to, you know, help somebody else. Uh, and yeah, that's a known fact that, you know, if you're going through something, you know, the best thing you can do is to, you know, relieve somebody of their pain and doing that is helping you to overcome your grief. So, uh, yes, I think you, you probably, I, I understand, did that through your seva. And I think in that sense, you consider a lot of your, like I would say, quote unquote, your work at the Oxford Center is also in, in, in one sense, indirectly, probably your seva. But before we go a little more into what you do at the Oxford Center, um, would you like to actually share that, you know, what inspired to be, what inspired you to be an um, to get into academia? Was it something that interested you since you were a child or something that, uh, you know, grew over the time as you grew older? Um, no, I never thought my whole life of becoming an academic. It's maybe the last thing I thought of. And I'm not an academic. I never went to university. I joined the temple at the age of 18 and spent 13 years in the ashram, uh, which is nearly exactly the time it takes to get a PhD. 
So I exactly did not. I exactly did the wrong thing to become an academic. <laughs> um, why I got into academia and scholarship and that was, I I got to know a lot of scholars and I really admired their intelligence. Uh, and a lot of the scholars I got to know were religious people. Uh, I got I got to know them in the context of interreligious dialogue. They they were religious people in dialogue with other religions, but they were scholars themselves in their own traditions. And I was I was very impressed by their depth of knowledge, they, their inquiring nature, their their critical attitude. And I don't mean an attitude of criticizing others. I mean an attitude of critical inquiry. It's the use of, of booty, the intelligence. So the intelligence, its function is to discern and discriminate. And uh, therefore you have to ask questions. And that's that's the critical inquiry. You're you're asking, what is this? What is this? And then what is this? So you don't stop asking that, um, even at the expense of annoying someone. The, the why child always asking why, 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 and and you know freaking the parents out. So that that's an important uh, facility. And I was very enthused by their association, um, and even their understandings of God were very deep, and. Um, I worked for many years in communications in ISKCON, and the communications department was the the, the refuse uh, disposal people. When a problem happened, you gave it to them, and they had to deal with the the dirty problem. Um, and we used to get together and have retreats and discuss what are the problems and how are we dealing with them. And we discerned very quickly that 85, 90% of our problems were self-inflicted. We were causing our own difficulties. So uh, what's the solution to that is education, reflection. You problem, you think about it, you critically analyze it, and then you make sure it doesn't happen again. And we didn't have that process. So we were going to be in communication for the rest of our lives, solving the same problems. So we thought, oh, okay, <laughs> we, we really have to do something about this. So we started to do a number of educational initiatives. So we, we developed the Vaishnav Training and Education Program which developed all kinds of training programs, including teacher training, went on to do Grihasta training. Now I do believe there's guru-disciple relationship courses, et cetera. So all, all of this came from that initiative. We developed Back to Vedanta College as a theology college for ISKCON, linked, and then the Oxford Center came as a, a separate institution um, that is developing the field of Hindu studies so that we can develop the field of Gaudiya Vaishnav studies because it needs a context, an academic context. And we found out that there wasn't a field, there wasn't a center for Hindu studies at the academic level, the high academic level. And this opportunity opened in Oxford with some scholars and we just took the opportunity and started to, to develop this thing that seemed like off the subject, but actually was very much on the subject. And that that's how it started. That's And th so my, my work is actually you said, you know, maybe my work is seva or not. My whole life is seva. All our lives are seva, serving this or that. But I tried to make it serving Krishna. So I went to Vrindavan for two weeks to pray before I took up this mission in Oxford. And um, I got blessings from so many quarters that this is what I should do. And I got blessings from Satsarup Maharaj and Mukunda Goswami and Indrajumda Swami and Radna Swami, so many people who said, yes, we 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 need to do this. So we set off on this adventure, and my job is to serve um, devotees who are highly intelligent, who are, you know, just to give them the opportunity to go on Sankirtan, work as a pujari, do management or whatever it is, plus do this, you know, go get a, 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 an Oxford degree in, in Gaudiya Vaishnav studies. Um, and the center itself is non-sectarian and non-political. It's it's not a Hare Krishna center. We have Muslims and Christians and Jews and atheists. Everyone's studying there, and they're all studying different things, as a proper academic center should be. But by developing that, that also means that Gaudiya Vaishnavs can study there and study their own subject, so that we've created the basis for that to happen. And that is happening, and devotees are qualifying, and those devotees in the last 20 years have qualified and become um, fully tenured professors in universities, in different parts of the world, in from Japan to um, the USA. So, as you just mentioned, that uh, since the last twenty years, so 
I mean, I would like to tell our audience that, you know, the Oxford Center has actually completed 20 years in this year, right? I think, am I right, Prabhu? Was it 2020 no, 20, that we completed 20 years? 20, 22 years. Wow. So congratulations on that. That That's a long journey. Can you a little bit share about what's your day at the Oxford Center like? Oh, goodness gracious me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just, I'll give you a snapshot. In one week, uh, unannounced, seven Swamis came on different days from different traditions. Some were Shaivites, some were Tattvavads, Swami Narayans, Iskhan, uh, Sri Vaishnavas. Uh, so, so the community and the communities are all involved in different ways. We have um, uh, Chinmaya, Swami Narayan, Iskhan, all kinds of Sampradaya studying at the center, becoming qualified. It's not just that this is good for Gaudiya studies, this is good for everybody. But the interesting thing is that they're working together. So on a Wednesday, we'll be sitting on our Wednesday lunch. Um, well, something's just happened to my screen that I don't know how to deal with. Okay. We can hear you and we can see. So I okay, think okay. that's good. So, so, uh, um, so on a Wednesday, we have a Wednesday lunch and um, different people uh, come in and cook. They're all devotees and they, they do. It's all no meat, fish, eggs, onions, garlic, mushrooms, alcohol and uh, prasad. And um, scholars, about 50 scholars and students come together and all eat together. And, and, uh, and that's just the collegial nature of bringing everyone together. But then you'll have all kinds of traditions sitting with each other, sharing with each other, learning from each other in a way that they don't have an excuse to in a normal circumstance. Swami Narayans and Iskhan don't you know, meet together very often to talk about things. But these young people are developing lifelong relationships by doing this. And they're doing it in a very gentlemanly way and a very friendly, ladylike way. Um, and these relationships are important for all our institutions going forward to have uh, a voice, a, a bigger voice uh, in, in in the societies in which we live. So that's one aspect. It's truly non-sectarian and non-political. And let's go down one other level, that some of our scholars are from the Gaudiya Math and some of our scholars are from Narayan Maharaj's Math and all that kind of stuff. This has nothing to do with our, our uh, way of choosing students. We just choose students who are excellent at what they do. So even within our Gaudiya studies, we have all these traditions working together in a way that they've never worked together before. And, and that's how we have to work together to go forward uh, in, a, in not only a, uh, a sensible way, a kind of common sense way, but that's advantageous for Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement globally. So, so to break down these barriers and focus on research and take different aspects of research and it's not that this is ISKCON's research and this is the Gaudiya Mat research and all that kind of stuff. It's not that. This is just research about Lord Chaitanya. This is research about Lord Nityananda. This is research about uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And you publish a book or findings. We have a conference and you share it. And this becomes, these become the standard works. The, the, these devotees become the world experts in these subject areas. And this is this is real advancement intellectually. So if society is like a triangle, and every society is, at the top of the triangle, you have your most qualified, most intellectual, most spiritually minded people. And Vedic culture says that's where you put your energy and everything trickles down from there. And there's always work happening at every level, but that's where you really put your energy. Hence Prabhupada over and over again says, facilitate the Brahmins, facilitate the Brahmins, What's our program to do that? So the program has to be educational in the first instance. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Brahmins are all about knowledge. They have to be pundits. Prabhupada says that a Brahmin is a pundit. And he said the, the work of a Brahmin is not to be learned simply, but is to share that learning. And that's the essence of our whole movement. So it's where are these people? And, and it's very interesting, when we opened our doors first, we thought that we would be a research center, but immediately students came out of nowhere, knocking on the door. We don't even know how they found out about us and signed up, devotee students. And you could immediately see where were they going to go otherwise? 
where, where were they going to go to get this facility of, of deep learning at this level with the best people in the world to become the best people in the world in our field to develop this particular field? Yeah, so I think that was a good insight. I think we understand service as just something that you do in the temple and a little bit outreach outside in terms of book distribution, hurry now, but I think just being the director there, uh, I think the scope of outreach that you have opened up the platform in relation to Hindu studies and getting members from all different organization is, is something that is beyond the scope of a lot of people. So. Um, I think that's really amazing and you know we, we really congratulate you on you know just initiating that effort and it's still going strong since the last 22 years so you know that's amazing one thing that you know has always a little bit increased and interested me is um, uh, in fact i kind of had this in mind when you know we last met at the vaishnav christian conference and um when they were reading out your name um to you know give give a presentation, they read it out as Shona Kurishi Das. And I was expecting maybe, you know, they would have your civil name there, but you know, you, you were using your initiated name there. So you have always presented yourself as Shona Kurishi Das. Um, and uh, even in the academic world. So what, uh, you know, really inspired you to do that? And how do you explain this getting accepted by people? Um, well, the, the fact is that Shona Kurishi Das is my legal name. Um, so it's not just that I'm using it um, as an underplume. Uh, I, I changed my name legally. Um, I was on the telephone one time many years ago with a Swami uh, who, he wasn't, an, it wasn't a Vaishnav Swami, he was actually an Edwaitin. And um, um, he said to me, he said, uh, your name is Shanaka Rishidas, but that's not your legal name, is it? And I said, no. He said, why not? I said, what do you mean? He said, if it's your name that Krishna gave you, then it's your name. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really have an argument. <laughs> and then I thought about it and I realized that um, everyone I knew knew me as Shana Karishi does, except my immediate family. And uh, I realized that actually it's, uh, yeah, why not? Why not just accept that this is who I am? Because as I started to work in Oxford, I had to start wearing suits and, you know, presenting myself in a different way uh, for, for, for the most part. Um, so how do I maintain my integrity in this new environment, which was new to me? Um, and that, that was, that was, a, it was a real issue. So I, I had to, one way of resolving it was, well, if my name is Shanika Rishi Das, I'm being totally upfront about who I am. Uh, and yeah, so, that, so I just, I just made that strange decision to uh, change my name. So on my driver's license, my passport, I'm Shana Karishi Das. It's caused me absolutely no difficulty whatsoever. That's never been an issue. I think it's it's not just strange, but I think it's wonderful. It's inspiring actually for a lot of people. And I think that beautiful thing, what you said that it's the name which Krishna has given me. It's the name which is connected to Krishna and you choose to use it. So. I think that's that's really something amazing. Uh, just talking about, about you know when, when I just asked you the the question last in relation to the Vaishnav Christian Conference and uh, during that time there was one thing that really left a deep impression on me and that was that uh, during the conference you, you you presented a few papers you were representing the academia you were there as the director of the Oxford Studies uh, and the Oxford Center rather and then afterwards when we would have a break um, I had my son with me during that time and during the lunch break, I would just see that he would go up, sit up with him uh, and, you know, just chat to him. So there was you, you know, who was at, at a certain intellectual level and you you know, was a 13 year old and you actually made him so comfortable. You inspired him to get more intellectually engaged. You gave him some reading recommendations and uh, that really uh, was so, uh, you know, I was just so impressed uh, by that side of you and I have known that over the times you have actually steadily encouraged a lot of students, uh, you have mentored them, uh, especially ones who have the potential to pursue, um, you know, studies in academia. 
So what really drives you? I mean, you you are always so personal, uh, you know, in helping a lot of devotees and, uh, you know, also students at, at the Oxford Center. So what drives you to help these students and to, you know, help them to explore the various pathways that lie ahead of them? Well, thank you for those uh, kind words. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's just our service. I mean, part of it is, as we get older in life, um, it, it's very important for us to help younger people. Um, I distinctly remember when I became a devotee, um, but was, uh, some years after I became a devotee, reading an, um, um, an editorial in the Back to Godhead magazine by Satsrup Maharaj, talking about that he's 40 now, and uh, it was a big deal. And, you know, uh, I was thinking, oh, there's someone in the movement who's 40. Oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> you know? uh, so there's an older generation. <laughs> um, and 40 is nothing. <laughs> it really isn't. So, you know, um, we need an older generation. That's just kind of common sense. But an older generation have a real responsibility. Whether asked for or not, they have to help uh, younger people because younger people kind of don't know what they want. And it's not really up to us to tell them, but we can we can, we can help direct them. We can give them hints. We can give them alternatives. We can, we can show them little vistas, open up a little window and, and let them look in. And it just gives them more choice, more perspective in life. But particularly when you meet someone who has real potential, who is actually very intelligent, um, People don't get a lot of um, uh, alternatives in life. You, you, they don't get a lot of choice. You know, um, a lot of educational systems, they funnel us into examinations, and those examinations mean occupations, and here's the occupations, and that's really it. And that's not choice at all. That's taking choice away. So an intelligent person needs a lot of choice so that their intelligence can be stimulated to learn how to make decisions, learn how to discriminate, learn how to discern. And to learn, you have to acquire knowledge. So they will acquire knowledge when there's a need. Otherwise, we can be a bit lazy. So we we have to kind of stir people's brains a little bit. I like to meet young people and kind of put my hand on their head, take their brain out and go like that and put it back and say, now what do you say? <laughs> And it's, it's stimulating for them. It gives them, it's like, wow. <laughs> and it's so, to see that spark in someone's eye, and particularly, I like it, obviously, I, I like to do it with all young people. Uh, it's, our, it's our dharmic responsibility. But among devotees, it's fantastic to give a perspective on Krishna, a perspective on Prabhupada, a perspective on ISKCON, where someone's having a difficulty that, you know, ISKCON's just an institution, doesn't care about me, and then you just... Go like that, and or 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 vice versa, <laughs> so so that we we really open it up, and I get this from the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna's um, mode of teaching is just extraordinary; it's brilliant. He Arjuna has his difficulty, and Krishna gives him uh, choices. He says, "Well, you could think of this and this and this," and he gives him a whole panoply of choices that Arjuna would never have thought about. And one of the first choices he gives him is, if you don't fight, people will laugh at you. What a mundane choice, <laughs> completely egotistical. But Krishna gives it, not because he favors it. He, he shows Arjuna the choice that he thinks Arjuna should make. But he gives him the choice because it is a choice. And to be credible, to be a, a good teacher, to, to really help someone, then you have to give them the choices that are actually there so that they can really make the choice in an informed way. Like your child is a teenager and they're going out for the first time to a big party, all night party, whatever it is. And as a parent, what are you thinking? Don't drink, don't smoke, don't have sex. <laughs> Hold the don'ts and, and do this, do get home at 10 o'clock and do blah, blah. So, but what if you sat down with your child and said, when you go to that party, People are going to offer you drugs. People are going to offer you sex. You know, the, this is real. Now, how are you going to respond to that? Just ask them and have a conversation with them, an informed conversation where you can question them and let them let them 
think it through for themselves and come up to their, with their own conclusion, whatever it may be. But just lead them on that a little bit, as Krishna did with Arjuna. Because then when someone comes up and says, here, try this drug, you know, it's great, it's fun, it's fun, go on, go on, go on. That's just peer pressure. There's no choice in that. It's just do it, do it, do it. The child needs to have thought about it before they got there, and that's our responsibility. And that's exactly what Krishna did wonderfully. And then at the end of it, he says to Arjuna, now you choose what to do. He gave him full full choice. Now, a bit of a cheat, because he attracted Arjuna's heart so much in the 12th chapter by saying, priyosti me, priyosti me, after so many texts, I, because of my affection for you, because of my love for you, he drew Arjuna in. Arjuna made his decision because of his love for Krishna, not for religion, not for dharma, not for philosophy, not for spirituality. It's because of his love for Krishna. That's why he did it. And Krishna drew him in. But he gave him the choice to make because love is a choice. And, and that, so that understanding that, you have to give young people, yeah, not only young people, everyone, but you have to give young people particularly, you have to expand their choices so that they, be, they begin to think. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I mean, you know, as a mother of the teenager, <laughs> I think that was a valuable insight that you offered. Uh, it's actually touched a chord with me. And uh, what you said that, you know, you help them to expand their choices. I, I think that should be a good take home for not only parents, but uh, even for a lot of devotees, you know, in our movement who are actually mentoring um, youth, students, a, a lot of youngsters, and I think also to some extent, just devotees in general, that you know we need to make a shift and we need to change that perspective and not see things just through the beaten way. So uh, thank you so much for you know offering that perspective, and you have actually, uh, in fact, uh, you know mentored and uh, you know inspired so many of. The youngsters and youth in the movement and they have actually flourished so beautifully uh, so they are such uh, great assets to our movement and you know they're going to go out and you know share this uh, you know share this bhakti movement uh, to a vast uh, expanse of audience which probably would not even happen at the temple so i think that's really amazing and uh, one question that I had in, in relation to, you know, speaking about ISKCON devotees that, you know, we are largely uh, a Gaudiya Vaishnav movement. We follow the Gaudiya Vaishnav Sampradaya. So what has been the impact of the research initiatives at the Oxford Center in the field of Gaudiya Vaishnavism? Uh, is, is there anything happening in relation to that? Anything new and upcoming in relation to any Gaudiya studies? Well, we, we have three major Gaudiya Vaishnav research projects going, the Bhagavat Purana project, Srimad Bhagavatam project, the uh, Goswami project about the development of Braj and Mundavan at the time of the Goswamis, and uh, Bengal Vaishnavism, which is Bhaktivinoda, Muktisiddhanta, and, and everything around that. Um, so they're, they're very big projects. There's a lot of text translation going on with that and other studies. Uh, one of the exciting thing that's happening just now is a pilot project where we're developing a Gaudiya studies program, particularly uh, aimed at devotees, practicing devotees, where we just have sm very small groups and we take them through, we have different teachers who are all graduates of the center, um, living in different parts of the world, but they're quite the expert in many cases, world experts on these subjects. So we take a small group of about seven students and just take them through a whole intellectual journey where they have to read a lot uh, of stuff and and really encourage them to question, question, question. Um, and it's done in a in a, a very good environment, a very supportive environment. Um, yeah, yeah. So that that's to me that's the most exciting thing now. That after all this time, we now have the fruit. Uh, the fruit is beginning to develop, and it it takes it takes about twenty years to develop a well-rounded scholar, about 13 years to get a PhD, a number of years to get set up in an academic position, and then a few years to get publications out and become comfortably situated so you can begin to perform. And you may think that that's a, a big, um, that's a long uh, time, but it's not a long time. It, it, it's um, Knowledge is, is a sattvic program. It takes the time it takes. Um, I'm a gardener. I love gardening. And if 
gardeners didn't plant oak trees for others, oak trees wouldn't get planted. You know, an oak tree, you, if I plant it now in my 50s, I, I won't see anything of its development in my lifetime. And my children will see something half decent, but nothing much. Their grandchildren will begin to see something that looks like an oak tree. And their grandchildren will really enjoy the oak tree. So how are we planning? And to do education properly, it has to be well planned. And it has to be very long term. And the pioneers will never see the, 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 the real fruits. The fruits that we're seeing now are just a good indication that this is working well. But these aren't, these aren't the real fruits. They'll happen well after I've passed away. Um, and and that, that's how we should plan but particularly in this kind of a program. And that's that's a nice service to do. So yeah, thank you for sowing those seeds at the Oxford Center and of course through your other extended sevas. Before we move ahead in this interview, I just wanna inform the audience and our viewers that you know we are 15 minutes into our interview and we have another 10 to 15 minutes to go. But before we move ahead, if you have any questions, please write them into the comment section and we will try our best to take your questions. Um, so before we you know, go back, Prabhu, I still just have a couple of questions for you. And this is that, um, is there a scope for someone who may not be able to you know, physically come and join the Institute at Oxford, but is still interested to pursue Hindu studies? Uh, is there any uh, facility to have online courses? Well, yeah, this um, Go to Your Studies program I was talking about, this is online. Um, this will only happen about twice a year. So it's it's very small, like 14 students a year. It's very small. Um, but for the for the Oxford Centre itself, we have um, a lot of online courses, about 20 online courses. They're very good courses, and the notes are really excellent. We're publishing the notes as uh, study guides. Um, but um, so, so, for instance, last term, that has just ended, we had about 650 students on the online courses. So in a year, it could be up to 2,000 students. So it's it's there's, there are four terms in a year for that. So there's tons of courses on the Vedas, Upanishads, the Mahabharata, and Ramayan, the Gita, God in the Gita, uh, Hindu temples, Hindu archaeology, um, Hindu music, uh, especially North Indian music, um, uh, yoga, uh, the Yoga Sutras, uh, yoga... Um, so many pathways that we're developing. Um, yeah. yeah. That was, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Even I didn't have an idea that you had these amazing courses. So how how do you get, do you just get to the uh, Oxford Center of Hindu Studies website? And if, if just you look up, your, yeah, if you look up Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, um, you'll, the whole first page on Google is going to be us. Uh, if you, I think if you just do Hindu Studies, um, you'll get, you'll get to these courses very, very easily. In fact, I think the courses come before we do. <laughs> so so okay. they're, they're, they're quite popular and they're, they're, they do well. Okay. We, we, we just want to continue. I, I still have so many questions, but I have to you know, come to my last question. And this is for the benefit of all our viewers, all our students, all our youngsters who are out there or who may like to pursue academia or who would like to you know, explore the field of education what advice and message would you like to give them? Um, read, read, read. Just read voraciously, read widely, read read history, philosophy, biography, um, whatever you can get your hands on. Read um, other religions, you know, just, just start to read because you learn so much from reading, you get a lot of knowledge, a lot of information. You, you, you are challenged constantly. So we're devotees and we have our our perspective and it's the best in the world. And then you start reading other things and you realize this sounds very similar. <laughs> so what's what's so special about my tradition? That challenge is very necessary for us to progress uh, maturely as a society, to get to the essence of Krishna consciousness. What's essential about uh, Krishna in Vrindavan? And what's what's important about Srila Prabhupada as an Acharya? When there are so many Acharyas out there, there's so much choice. Why have we chosen this one? Maybe we didn't choose this one. Maybe we were born into this. But we need to make a choice. It needs to be a conscious choice. It says in the Bhagavatam, thus 
thus in the third canto, thus consciously engaged in devotional service. And I remember I read that as an 18 year old and I thought, wow, that's extraordinary, consciously engaged. It's a choice that you make. That's incredible, that's great. <laughs> it's a, it's, this is my choice, I've chosen this. And th so that's what we have to do no matter who we are. We have to make a conscious choice that this is what I want to do, this is who I am, and this is what it involves. This is the sacrifice I'm going to have to make to do this. This is where, it, so you're, we're going in with our eyes open. So by reading, ironically, if you're an intelligent person, you have to read, you'll end up reading anyway. <laughs> um, so just read voraciously and and use it to sharpen our critical faculty. And that will help us in application to any university. And the other, the other thing apart from reading is writing. Um, practice writing essays, give yourself essays to write, maybe on the aesthetic value and the peeling of an orange or some stupid, <laughs> stupid uh, idea. I think that's a topic I gave to your son. <laughs> and I think he wrote an essay on it too, uh, <laughs> uh, which is even more surprising. So so whatever, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Just get used to writing, get used to using words and vocabulary. Because again, if you're going to university education, that will help tremendously. And you, not everyone has to come to Oxford by any manner or means. Do the best course that you can get. We can help advise what's a good course or how to link your course into the global development of Gaudiya Vaishnav studies, which is now becoming a real field of study, a recognized field of study um, uh, uh, internationally in the in the academy. So that we were, that's being established. And we need devotees to come and start doing these studies, uh, but they need to take it seriously. It is a serious, uh, it's it's a vocation, it's a calling, it's not an occupation, it's not it's not a way of making money. It's a sattvic enterprise. You do it because you can do it. You have the intellect to do it, and and you know you can help others by doing it. And you become part of a, a wonderful sangha of really, really, really nice devotees, really wonderful devotees. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, I remember that's what you told my son: read, 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 and write, write, write. And uh, I'm, I'm still getting him to do that. But uh, I mean, I just want to, you know, echo that on behalf of everyone who's here, all our viewers, parents, or even, you know, devotees who are mentoring young youngsters that I think they would really value this. And I think we as devotees also need to do this, especially in this day and age of internet where you can have so many distractions. Uh, we've lost our touch with reading and writing. So thank you for bringing us back you know, to, you know, thinking about this. Um, we're going to now, I mean, though I have a lot of questions and I would just want to continue this. We're going to go back to our audience because they have some questions. We have quite a few people here, Shonaka Prabhu, who are, you know, who have joined us on Facebook. And I'm going to just take some questions. We take the first one is from Krishna Leela. Krishna Leela uh, is our editor with ISKCON News. And here is her question for you, Shonaka Prabhu. Uh, thank you for the great discussion. Shonaka has been a great mentor to me since my early 20s. I have always appreciated his, his depth of wisdom, love, spiced up with Irish humor, which always made me feel him to be very re relatable. My question is, I think you can even see it up here on the screen. You have gone through a lot of difficulties lately. Do you still have your great sense of humor? If so, is there, what is the role of humor in Vaishnav community? Thank you, Krishna Leela, for this question. Uh, something even I would have liked to ask Prabhu. So here you are, Shonaka Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna Leela. Uh, all my love to you. I was supposed to meet you um, uh, in August last year, but I, I ended up not going to Florida. So I, I accept my apologies. Um, uh, yes, I still have my sense of humor. Uh, uh, Krishna is kind enough to keep me laughing through it all. Um, uh, it's very important. Humor is very important in every community. I mean, Madhu Mangal in Krishna's pastimes is full of humor. You know, and Krishna's always playing jokes on people. Um, that's one of the reasons why I like Krishna so much because he's such a rascal, and he's just it's he's always he's all he's always being funny and and you know putting us in situations where you just have to laugh you know it's just when you see it as krishna's mercy then it's just funny um krishna is very funny and very kind and uh uh as the bodhis we have to i remember the late sridhar swami um so I, I got to know him a lot through the years and uh so he got very ill 
uh, with his cancer. And I was talking to him just before he left to um, Mayapur for the last time. And I said to him, and this is a conversation we've been having for a while. I said, so what is a, what do you see is now at this time in your life? What do you see as the important thing? Um, and he said, um, do you know what? I thought it was so important to become a sannyasi. And I thought it was so important to become a GBC man. And I thought it was so important to be a senior devotee. And he said, none of that is important. And I said, what's important? He said, fun. We have to have fun. ISKCON doesn't have fun. <laughs> because it, it creates it creates a, it creates a harmony among devotees. It lightens things up. Egos relax. You know, we're all tense with each other. And when someone cracks a joke, we all have to laugh. We have no choice. We, when someone does something stupid and takes that risk of being stupid and, and everyone laughs, then it breaks down so much. And then you can start to talk. You can start to have a real relationship. And our Vaishnav community is all about relationships. It's not really about anything else. All the philosophy, all the religion, all the puja, all the rules and regulations, they can go to hell because it's all about Krishna and our relationship with Krishna and everything else is only there to support that. That's that's its only significance. So unless unless we can get rid of our ego and get down to interpersonal relationships with devotees, real relationships, to talk about the real issues of life and to talk about the difficult issues of life in a real way, in connection with Krishna, then we're not really even living. So fun is, is one of the ingredients that breaks these things down. It's not anger, they are the other emotions. So, yeah. So I, I, I being Irish, we are, we're always telling jokes and not taking things seriously anyway. So I've got a congenital disposition <laughs> to that. The, so uh, yeah, humor is important. Thank you. Yeah, I think we, we, we just you, have this work now that we have so much resistance to, you know, having fun, which is so true. So, yeah, I think that's a learning I'm going to take home that, you know, just have fun, lighten up. And um, we're going to take our next question, which is from Preman Janadas. Uh, he has two parts to his questions. I think the first one's about online course, which you've already answered. The second part of his question is, is there any way that we can contribute from this part of the world? Um, what, what part of the world is that? Uh, so his question is that, are there any online courses on Gaudiya Vaishnavism that we can take from our own location? So from what I understand, Preman Janadas is actually based in Punjabi Bagh, Delhi. And okay. he's asking that, uh, is there any way that we can contribute from this part of the world? Um, uh, yes, uh, all our online courses are online, which means you can you can uh, participate from any any part of the world. Um, when you say, "Is there any way we can contribute from this part of the world?" I don't know what you mean by contribute. Our, our courses are developed by trained scholars. Um, it's not enough that we get trained up within ISKCON because that that's brilliant for giving us the ISKCON perspective. But that's not even the Gaudiya perspective. That's the ISKCON perspective within Gaudiya Vaishnavism. So to, to do a scholarly course, you have to have a much broader perspective, a greater breadth of knowledge of what the issues of the whatever you're dealing with is, including Gaudiya Vaishnavism. So we can't just give a talk on the Bhagavad Gita and only take into account uh, Prabhupada's conclusion. We also have to take into account other conclusions. So because otherwise we don't really realize the value of Prabhupada's conclusion, unless we compare it. And we have to be not afraid to compare it. You know, so when you compare it to Sankaracharya, you begin to realize Sankaracharya really struggles with the Gita. He has he has great difficulty in his commentary in the Gita because the Gita is a personalist text and it is a bhakti text. Uh, and he's trying to say that it's about Advaita and it's not as simple as that, <laughs> unfortunately. So. So that that's that's a that's a difficulty. Uh, 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 well, that's an important thing. And also, um, you have Tilak making it a nationalist thing. Um, you have Gandhi doing his interpretation of the Gita. Aurobindo doing his interpretation. So many people just taking the Gita. And unless you study them, you don't see why Prabhupada's why it is so important. 
uh, we, we can just make the claim, Bhagavad Gita as it is, this is the only way to understand it. There's no other way. And we, we very quickly sound like fundamentalist preachers of a Christian mold. And we're just shoving a book down your neck. That's what it sounds like to most people. Unless you can show that you've studied all the other interpretations or the main ones, and you have a very good idea what you're talking about. That's very impressive. When people ask an intelligent question, they expect an intelligent, informed answer. We have to be the people with that informed answer to make it, to make it credible. Is Prabhupada's contribution uh, a really good contribution to the field? Is it a good contribution to helping people in this context, this context? Then you have to study the context in a global sense. Uh, otherwise, it, we're not we're not doing our job. We're really not applying our intelligence to our mission. We're just going out there beating people over the head with a book, and 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 that you know it's a really good book. It's a spiritual book, so you beat them over the head and they get purified. Great, fantastic. But there's so much more we can do. So we do have to use our intelligence, and we have to culture intelligence. Intelligence has to be cultured, and that's what education is about. Education isn't training training someone to preach. You can give them the mantra cards and tell them to go out and say this, and if you get this one, say this, etc. That, that's no good. It has to be education, which means you give them the ability to think for themselves. So when they go out, they they can think it through. They, they can say to the person, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that. Let me get back to you. That's honesty. You're displaying honesty and humility to that person. That's more effective than some bogus answer that just makes you sound like you know everything. But it's it's just you're just trying to make it up as you go along. It becomes an ego situation. Let there be humility. Trina the peace on each and Let let there be real knowledge. And humility and honesty come through confidence. And we have to have confidence in Krishna that 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 Krishna is God and Prabhupada is the boss. <laughs> uh, and to get to that stage, we have to study and study. So, it, it, so yeah, good question. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, Shonaka Prabhu. We have another question from Hari Das, Trini Krishna Das. Uh, we are going a little over time, but I don't think anybody would mind. I think we're just so much enjoying. So here is a question. Devotees are taking up management positions instead of learning and disseminating their knowledge. How can we stem this or encourage both? Um, well, Haridas, it's um, it's good that you say encourage both because it's not either or. Management positions are very important, you know. Um, but it is it is kind of it's like Sridhar Swami's analysis. You know, he went up the the ladder that we have created in ISKCON, You know, of of hierarchies. That if you're a GBC man, if you're a temple president, if you're a regional secretary, if you're a, a swami, etc., if you're a guru, then these are all um, aspirational uh, things. But they're not really aspirational things. Uh, um, uh, they're services. Uh, these are services that we do to help other people. Um, and we have kind of created a little mentality of the Maharati, the the Kshatriya mold, the powerful, strong leader, manager type. Um, and again, this kind of a little bit bogus in our um, theological perspective. It is Trinada P. We are there to be humble servants, no matter what position we hold. Um, and it's just getting that right. So it doesn't matter what position we have. I, I think one difficulty we might have sometimes is we're, we're a little afraid of critical inquiry. Sometimes I've noticed in ISKCON. Um, someone asks an intelligent question in a class or something, and the, the speaker is a bit threatened by it. Um, we, we, we can never be afraid of, of a question, even if we don't have the answer. It's just we feel a failure if we don't have the answer. But we can always say the three golden words of preaching, I don't know. Because we're, who are we? We're only insignificant servants. And we can say, I don't know. That's a very good question. Let me think about that. That's that's an intelligent answer. That's a much more intelligent answer. And you're giving the example of being being a devotee by giving that humble humble answer. So we, it's it's not a question of either or. It's a question of both and. So we have to have good management, and we have to have good intelligence, and we have to have pundits. And not self-proclaimed pandits or someone who's on the Bhakti Shastri course or a Bhakti Bhabhava course. It's someone who's 
more highly educated. And and a pundit isn't a sadhu. The sadhu can be the, the humble pot washer who is just that spiritual person that has taken birth for that reason. So intellectualism isn't the be all and end all. As I say, I myself don't have a degree, yet I spend most of my time encouraging others <laughs> in that direction. But I'm very clear that devotional service is about our heart's relationship with Krishna, serving Krishna heart to heart, having that relationship, relating to other people heart to heart. The head is a part of it. It's a very important part of it, especially when it comes to in institutional development. But it's not the be all and end all. The be all and end all is our heart and its relationship with Krishna and consequently with others. Thank you for that, Prabhu. Uh, I'm just taking the last question for the day. This is from Aradhya Bhagwan Das. Uh, he's asking how to apply for PhD at the Oxford Center, where to get information. Can we have an email ID or a person who can guide us? Um, yeah, okay. Um, well, the one thing, applying for a PhD, at, you're, you're not applying for a PhD at the OCHS. You're applying for a PhD at Oxford University. And that is... Um, as difficult as it sounds. So, it, so it, um, I mean, the biggest reason people don't get into Oxford is they don't apply. So do apply if, if you have the credentials. But you can't apply for a PhD at Oxford or, or Cambridge or Harvard or Yale without um, an undergraduate or a master's degree in the subject you're applying for. So it's not that our, you know, we've we're a, a software engineer or we're a, a chemist or, or some other thing, and then we suddenly apply for theology or philosophy degree. Um, that really won't work. We have to qualify ourselves. So if you already have um, some qualification in this area, then yes, you can apply for a PhD in that area and uh, see if you can accept it, get accepted into Oxford. And at, at Oxford, we can help you, advise you as to, you know, if, if your proposal cuts it you know and, and but the thing is if you don't get into oxford you can apply for somewhere else it, don't don't be discouraged oxford is a bit of an ask for a lot of people um uh, and it only accepts so many people and it's expensive and all that so that i'm not trying to discourage you but so if you want to you can um uh write write to me shonaka s-h-a-u-n-a-k-a at o-c-h-s oxford center for hindu studies dot org Dot UK. That's Shonika, S H A U N A K A at O C H S dot org dot UK. And I'll take about five years to answer. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that, Prabhu. I think, you know, you, you just touched upon so many beautiful topics here. One is how to practically stay strong in face of crisis. We just got into the insight of the impact the Oxford Center has in the field of Hindu studies and Gaudiya Vaishnavism, and a little bit into how to, you know, help youngsters, children focus and help them to pursue their pathway. So we are very grateful for that. And uh, one thing that I cannot resist at this point is that, you know, I, I, I should be closing this, but uh, I just want to ask you if it's possible, can you share a joke with us? A joke? Joke, yeah. If you know, oh, God. Uh, talk something um, about fun, and uh, okay, I so know here, we don't do this in. Here's a joke. So there was a devotee. I can't with you. There was a devotee, and he was he was late for a meeting, and uh, it was a very important meeting to plan the Sankirtan marathon. So um, he was driving around looking for a parking space, and he couldn't find one. So he was driving around everywhere, and he was ten minutes late, and he was just thinking, oh. He said, Krishna, please, please help me find a parking space. I know that I shouldn't be asking you to do things. I don't want you to serve me, Lord. This is to serve you. I'm trying to organize the Sankirtan Marathon. It's to serve everybody. But please, please just help me. And then he turned around the corner and there was a parking space. So he drove in. He said, it's okay. Found one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I, I have so much of take home from this you know, session with you, Shanaka Prabhu. And I'm sure a lot of devotees will have this. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go back and actually replay this. And you know, you're, because the, there was so much that you gave us through this. So um, 
you know, despite I think we we came to you know gain some uh, you know you know, talk to you about that you were you know contracted the COVID, but I think we have contracted a little bit of the sense of humor, the fun, and the element of learning that you have shared with us. So thank you so much for that. And uh, I also want to thank Anuradha and Shakshi Gopal Prabhu who are offering technical support to us right now. And also on behalf of myself and the strategic planning team, uh, we want to thank you very much, Shonak Prabhu, that I know this was difficult for you. You you are a little bit isolating. And, you know, as you said, you don't want to come in public. And now, now you have this maybe 1,000, 2,000 people that are out here, you know, watching you. But thank you for doing that for us. We so much appreciate that and wish you all the best with a good quick recovery and also many beautiful, inspiring years at the Oxford Center. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you and all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Krishna. And for our viewers, uh, this video is going to be up on the Facebook uh, the GBC SPT Facebook live page. So you can come back and hear it again. It's also going to be available on YouTube at the GBC SPT uh, YouTube channel. So yes, please do share with it. And we're going to have a lot more interviews coming up. So stay tuned. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.